Good morning. Good morning. Whew, you guys are loud. That's great. <clears throat> this is good. It is good to be together in the Lord's house today as he has brought us together as his family into his house to uh, serve us with his gifts, especially his word of forgiveness of life and salvation, not only for us, but also for a new member of the family who's going to join God's house, Judah. Uh, yep, that's, that's my boy. <clears throat> so um, we've got a new son in our family. <clears throat> We're all healthy, <clears throat> I promise, <laughs> uh, which is good. Uh, yeah, Mom and Judah are healthy as well. Everly is doing good too. Um, but today is a good day because no matter what family we find ourselves in, when we are in the Lord's family, all is well and good because he gives us that life and salvation and forgiveness we need. And so today, as we begin, uh, we step into the first Sunday in Lent where we find <clears throat> Jesus tempted. Uh, and he gives us all that we need in the midst of our temptations. And so we will see uh, his life on display for us as he uh, gives us... <laughs> um, all that we need to support our body and life. So, <clears throat> let's focus our hearts and our minds on the Lord and His Word and His gifts this morning as He, joins, as he brings us to sing together our opening hymn, Worthy of Worship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dearly beloved, Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Matthew, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. 
In the last chapter of Mark, our Lord promises whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And the apostle Peter has written, baptism now saves you. Through scripture, God convinces us that he works a mighty and mysterious miracle in baptism for all who believe. You may be seated. The Word of God also teaches us that we all are conceived and born sinful and are under the power of the devil until Christ claims us as his own. We would be lost forever unless we were delivered from sin, death, and everlasting condemnation. But the Father of all mercy has sent his Son, Jesus Christ, who atoned for the sin of the whole world, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And so I ask you, how is your son, our son, to be named? <laughs> Judah, Jonathan, Jonke. Judah, Jonathan, Jonke, receive the sign of the cross both upon your forehead and upon your heart to mark you as one redeemed by Christ crucified and risen. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, according to your strict judgment, you condemned the unbelieving world through the flood, and yet according to your great mercy, you preserved believing Noah and his family, eight souls in all. You drowned hard-hearted Pharaoh and all his hosts in the Red Sea, and yet you led your people Israel through the water on dry ground, foreshadowing this washing of your holy, holy baptism. Through the baptism in the Jordan of your beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, you sanctified and instituted all waters to be a blessed flood and a lavish washing away of sin. We pray that you would behold Judah according to your boundless mercy, and you would bless him with true faith by the Holy Spirit, that through this saving flood all sin in him, which has been inherited from Adam, and which he himself has committed since, would be drowned and die. Grant that he be kept safe and secure in the holy ark of the Christian church, so that being separated from the multitude of unbelievers, he would serve your name at all times with a fervent spirit and a joyful hope, so that with all believers in your promise, he would be declared worthy of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. From ancient times, the Christian church has observed the custom of appointing sponsors for baptismal candidates and catechumens, that is, those who have been learning the faith. In the Evangelical Lutheran Church, sponsors are to confess the faith expressed in the Apostles' Creed and taught in the small catechism. They are, whenever possible, to witness the baptism of those they sponsor. And they are to do four things. One, they are to pray for him, support him in his ongoing instruction, and nurture him in the Christian faith. And, and three, encourage him to a faithful reception of the Lord's Supper. And finally, fourth, they are at all times to be examples to the sponsor of the holy life of faith in Christ and love for their neighbor. So I ask you, is it your intention to serve Judah as sponsors of the Christian faith? If so, say yes with the help of God. Yes, with the help of God. Then I pray that God enables each of you to will and to do this faithful and loving work with God's grace, so that he would fulfill all what we are unable to do. Hear the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark. They brought young children to Jesus <clears throat> that he might touch them and lay his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them and those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased, and he said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them. For of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And Jesus took them up into his arms and he put his hands on them and blessed them. Please stand as you are able. So let us pray the prayer our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Because Judah cannot answer for himself, I'll invite the parents and sponsors, as well as you, congregation, to speak faithfully on behalf in testimony of the forgiveness of sin and new life that he will receive. So do you all renounce the devil and all his works and all his ways? Do you believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth? Yes, I believe. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried? He descended into hell. And the third day he rose again from the dead, and he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. Yes, I believe. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting? Yes, I believe. You may be seated, and at this time, all the children are welcome to come forward. Would you hold on to that? Would you hold on to that? Kids, you're welcome to come on forward here because we're going to have Judah baptized here in a little bit. Don't be shy. Come right up to the front. <clears throat> Make a little semicircle for everyone to come and see. <clears throat> Carly, Etta, come on up. Cora, you too. Everly, if you want to join everyone, that's great too. You can sit next to Grace. <clears throat> Cora, do you want to come over here? There's space right over here. Awesome. Nice boots. Good. All right, boys and girls. Can I take Judah? All right, this, boy, you're warm. <clears throat> this is Judah. Now, whose brother is this? Raise your hand if this is your brother. Yep, that's your brother. But you know what? When God baptizes Judah here in a little bit, guess whose brother he's going to be? Yeah, Ryden, he's going to be your brother. Everyone, you should raise your hand because he's going to be your brother now. You're going to gain a brother in the faith. God is going to give you a whole nother brother because when Judah is baptized, he's baptized into a name. Name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's the name you all were baptized into. And you can say, hey, I'm God's child. Just like Judah one day will be able to say, hey, I'm God's child too. And what are all the things, you can put that back on his foot, thank you. All the things that Judah gets is a new family that loves and cares for him, that will support him, just like you get, and you get to resolve your conflicts with them and work through the things that frustrate you so that you can see God's good grace and his mercy working in your life. So should we see Judah get baptized? All right, say, say yes, pastor, if you want to see Judah get baptized. One, two, three. Yes, pastor. Woohoo! yeah, this will be great. Oh, this will be great. So... <clears throat> Judah, Jonathan, Jonke, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, you all, can you say, hi, brother? Hi, brother. Let's say that on the count of three. One, two, three. Hi, brother. This is your brother, Judah, in Christ. So, the Almighty God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given you, Judah, a new birth of water and of the Spirit, he has forgiven you all your sins. May he strengthen you with his grace to life everlasting. Amen. All right, boys and girls, we're going to see some other things that are given to uh, Judah and his family here. Thank you, Cora. Thank you so much. Hey, what color is Judah wearing today? White. What does the color white represent? Does anyone, what does it mean that Judah's wearing white? Do you remember? Remember? Look at this candle. It's white. What color am I wearing? White. white. That's to remind us that all of Judah's sins have been washed away. He is clean. What am I holding right here? 
A candle? Yeah, and what's at the top? Fire, yeah, it's warm and hot. Uh, it reminds us, if I took this into a dark room, could you see anything if I took this into a dark room? Yeah, what could you see? You could see light. You could take this candle around and you could look at all the things that are in darkness. This light is going to be given to Judah to remember on his baptism next year that he has the light of the world in his life, Jesus Christ. You don't like fire? Yeah, that's okay. <clears throat> so this cloth will remind, remind Judah that all his sins has been, have been washed away and that he is clothed with Christ's righteousness throughout all the days of his life. So boys and girls, why don't you stand up as we continue with our baptismal liturgy and we are going to uh, pray. Uh, in holy baptism, God the Father has made Judah a member of his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and an heir with us of all the treasures of heaven in the one holy Christian and apostolic church. So we receive Judah in Jesus' name as our brother in Christ, that together with him we might hear his word and receive God's gifts and proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen. We welcome you in the name of the Lord. Let's welcome Judah. All right, boys and girls, you can head back to your seats. <clears throat> and let us pray. Almighty and most merciful God and Father, we thank and praise you that you graciously preserve and enlarge your family and have granted Judah the new birth in holy baptism and made him a member of your son, our Lord Jesus Christ, an heir of your heavenly kingdom. We implore you that as you have now, as he has now become your child, you would keep him in his baptismal grace, that according to the praise and honor of your holy name, and finally with all your saints, he would obtain the promised inheritance in heaven through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand as you are able and you all can head back to your seats. Since all of Judah's sins have been drowned and died, let us also come before God and lay our sins before him. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It was in this triune name of God that we were baptized. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. As we begin our Lenten journey, we remember our own baptism. We remember we were, we remember we were made members of God's family. We remember we were united with Jesus. Though we are baptized and united with Jesus, we often act as if we were separated from Jesus. There are times when we fall prey to Satan and his temptations. There are times where sin reigns within us. Still, our Heavenly Father is merciful and invites us to draw near to him in repentance and ask for forgiveness. Heavenly Father, we have ignored your help in resisting Satan and his temptations. We have sinned against you in our thoughts, words, and actions. Yet our entire lives are lives of repentance. Have mercy on us, forgive our sins, and lead us in righteousness on account of Jesus. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son, Jesus Christ, to endure temptation, suffering, and death for us and our salvation. So as a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are forgiven. We are baptized into Christ. Lord, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. 
Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. So the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you endured the temptations of Satan in the wilderness. Be present with us on our Lenten journey toward the cross and empty tomb, always mindful of our identity as those baptized in your name. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our Old Testament reading for this first Sunday in Lent comes from Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 18, where we see uh, the famous story of Abraham journeying with his son Isaac up the mountain. Sometime later, God tested Abraham, and he said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. And on the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay your ha a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns, and he went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, On the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. So the angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and the, through your offspring, all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle for today is from uh, James chapter 1, verse 12 through 18. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that is God, God has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire is conceived, it's and it gives its birth to sin, and sin is, is, is full-grown, gives birth to death. 
But don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. This is the word of the Lord. Stand as you are able, out of reverence for the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, as we sing together. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth into Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw from heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated as we sing our sermon hymn, O Lord, throughout these 40 days, hymn 418.
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. All of the readings today that the church reads around the world revolve around the idea of temptation. In Genesis, in the Old Testament reading, the big question that's facing us is, as we read it, is God going to go against his promises? Is Abraham going to remain faithful through a seemingly impossible situation? In the Gospel reading in Mark, we experience Jesus' baptism, and immediately after he's baptized, he's driven out into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. And what does it say? But he is there to be tempted. He's being tempted by Satan. Finally, James, our epistle reading, mentions the finer details of what temptation looks like. It comes to exist in the lives of God's creation, us, humans. And James tells us what to do about it. And it's here in the epistle in the book of James that I'd like us to journey through today and experience what God is and is not doing. First, God in the book of James is not there to dig up our failures. He is there to harvest his promises. So uh, if you find it, your pew Bibles in front of you, if you look in your pews and pull out a Bible and turn to James chapter 1, which can be found on 1196, that's where we're going to be journeying through today and seeing what God has planted in his word. James chapter 1, verses 12 through 18, on page 1196. When you think about temptation, often we, we tend to conceptualize temptation as something that I am struggling with, me, myself, and I, and it comes and displays itself in two ways. It can happen with things that are outside of us that put pressure on us, or it can be something that we deal with internally that causes us stress, anxiety, or worry that we fear it might show itself on the outside. So temptation displays itself in outward, out, outwardly ways and inward ways. And in James chapter 1, though, we find James focusing in particularly on the inside. Sure, there are lots of things on the outside that we could see that tempt us, but James wants us to focus on what is going on inside of us and really truly where temptation comes from. Verse 12, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. Then you skip down to verse 13, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone, but each one is tempted when by his own evil desire, he's dragged away and enticed. That's what it's like to experience the inward battle of temptation when you're dragged into yourself and you see all the things going on that you have done and been drawn to and you fear that you can't control it. You fear that you can't control what it's going to do to the inside of your life and you fear that things might spill out outwardly to those around you, whether it be to those that you love in your family, those that you work with at work, or even just a random stranger that you're driving by. Temptation drags us inwardly. And it begins inwardly, as James says. It begins in the desires of our own hearts. James then continues to focus in on that which comes from inside of us when he says, after desire has conceived, in verse 15, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. 
I share this with you this morning on the inside of temptation because that's a long process. It's a long process inwardly in which we are tempted and then that gives birth to sin and sin then gives birth to death. There are lots of steps that Satan has to go through in order to convince us that the best route for us to go is sin. For example, when you're driving down the road and you're heading north out of Alexandria, you can see one of Satan's works that has been lingering for far too long in this area. When you're driving along all innocently and you know that there's nothing inside of you that's yearning for what you're about to see, and then all of a sudden you peek over to your right and there it is, something that you can't avoid seeing, that giant billboard. And for far too long it sat there enticing you to a desire inwardly. Sure, it may not be there immediately, but then you begin to think to yourself, well, I've never been inside there. I've never done that. And I sure as heck won't ever do that. No one would ever catch me dead inside there. But then all of a sudden later, when you're at home alone on your phone or on your computer and no one else is there and desire starts to give way to temptation and you think to yourself, well, no one's here to stop me. Desire gives birth to sin, and sin gives birth to death. And what does that end up leading to? The inward destruction of desire that we are driven into causes us fear and anxiety about that which has come inside of us, and we're worried that it might pour out to the outside. Who might notice? Will they care if I've changed in any way? Are they even going to hold me accountable for the things that I know that I've been thinking? James warns us about what can happen inwardly in our own lives. All temptation inside of ourselves can lead to sin. But there's also sin outside of ourselves that can draw us into ourselves. When you look outside of yourselves, you can look at the world and you can get a notification on your phone and just as you celebrated the previous night with friends, hanging out, enjoying a fun football game and just a game of silly entertainment, the next morning you wake up and you find out that there was yet another shooting and more lives were hurt and a few lives were killed and you begin to worry about which side your friends are going to take on an issue that wasn't a political issue to start with and now it has become that. And somehow in the midst of it all, those who were outside of the issue have now been affected inside their families. Death has come on the outside. Children hurt. Children arrested. And you want to fight it on the outside, and yet what it does to the inside of you is what God wants to address first And foremost, look at verse 15 again in James. After desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. So what is our hope? Verse 16 says, don't be deceived, brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above. So we are pointed in James not to look inside of ourselves, but look outside of ourselves. Often when we encounter problems inside of ourselves or outside of ourselves, we look to the world, to friends or to family, to institutions to solve our problems. But James says... Yes, look outside of yourself, but look particularly above. Look above. 
For every good and perfect gift comes from the Father. Your very body with which you live in the world to serve one another, whether it be your spouse with your body physically, was given to you by God as a good gift. The gift of creation, of enjoyment, of entertainment, which is outside of yourself that you spend in relationship with one another, is a good and perfect gift from, a, from God. But all of that can descend into chaos if we don't continue to see where God has promised that gift to come from. Look at verse 17. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. Isn't that what it's like when you're struggling with temptation and sin inside of yourself? It feels as though you are unstable and you don't know what step is the next right step to take. When you're working with problems outside of yourself, whether it be within your family or something more stressful in a conversation that is, that is global in scope, like a political issue, you don't know which step is the next right step to take, and it feels as though your relationship with that person might spiral out of control. So look above. Look to the one who doesn't change. Verse 18, he chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all his creatures. You see, what God has planted here in baptism for all of you was the seed of faith in Jesus Christ. And when Jesus Christ went into the waters of Jordan and he was baptized, he started to plant a field of good fruit that would bless the entire world and from it would begin to heal that which is inside. The temptations that we would rather hold on to inside of ourselves, the fear, the doubt, the worry, the lust, the envy, the greed. Jesus, through baptism, goes inside our lives and redeems it. He claims it away from Satan and he purifies it from all unrighteousness and all uncleanness. And you can see as he lived his life outwardly that his baptism changed the world. When he looked above, he saw heaven being torn open and the dove descending on him. And the father said, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. And he began to live in relationship with his neighbors, healing them when they needed to be healed, listening to them when they needed to be listened to, caring for them when they could not understand the chaos that was going on inside of them, and they could not change the world that was outside of them. Jesus called them back to where he planted life in the waters of holy baptism just like he began Judah's life here today. When Judah was taken from that which was inside of himself, temptations to only care about himself, and that which was outside of himself, all the power of evil and the world that could come crashing in against him and his life from here on out, in baptism, God planted salvation for him. God came down and planted forgiveness for Judah throughout the rest of the days of his life. And so when he comes against the world now in the days ahead for him, where do we turn? We turn Judah to the Lord above. When we are wondering where our lives stand with God, we ask one another, where do we turn? And we turn one another to the Lord Turn to where God first planted his promise for you. 
That's what verse 12 began to say. So if you look back at James chapter 1, verse 12, this is what it said. Blessed is the one who remains steadfast through temptation. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. And you might say to yourself, well, I know that there are days when I feel like I don't love God. I know that there are days when I feel unloved by God because of what I have done, either inside my life that I would not want anyone to know about, or the things that people have seen, the way I have acted. But God promised you the crown of life. That was the word which he planted in your own baptisms that he gave you new life so that when you are crushed by the world, you would turn back to him. When you are crushed by that which goes on in yourself, you would turn back to him. Because Mark 1 assures us that when we are in the wilderness of our own lives, Jesus has already conquered. Jesus has already won freedom for us from sin, death, and the power of the devil. So here again, the words of our gospel verse, him, which says this. The old satanic foe, he has sworn to work us woe. With his craft and dreadful might, he arms himself to fight. On earth he has no equal, but then it goes on in verse 4 to say this, God's word forever shall abide. No thanks to foes who fear it, for God himself fights by our side with weapons of the Spirit. Were they to take our house, our goods, our honor, our child or spouse, though all life be wretched away, they cannot win the day. The temptations that go on inside of us can't win the day. The pressures of the world that are outside of us cannot win the day. The kingdom is ours forever. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all our understanding keep and guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand as you are able as we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. We confess together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O Lord, in the midst of this life we are beset by many temptations. Fix our eyes on our Lord Jesus who bore temptation for us and resisted to the point of death and bring us through the evils of this fallen world to dwell with you forever. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, you place the wood of the cross on the back of your only begotten son that as the promised offspring of Abraham he might possess the gates of hell. Bless, we pray, his church and all those called to preach and teach within her Give them certainty that hell cannot prevail against them, and so embolden us in faith to trample every power of the enemy underfoot. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, preserve all catechumens and learners of the faith and their teachers, all children and their parents as they teach them, and every Christian home from the assaults of the evil one. As your son overcame Satan in the desert by the word of God, so also give us the victory through Christ and his word. Lord, in your mercy. Father of all lights, from whom every good and perfect gift comes down to us from above, keep us from being enticed by our own desires to misuse your gifts. Help us use them rightly in service to you and our neighbor. 
Bless Joseph and all our leaders that we may be governed wisely and justly for the good of this present generation and those to come. Lord, in your mercy. Most high God, our refuge in every trouble, you have promised to hear when we call to you. Command your angels to guard our brothers and sisters and all who suffer in our midst, especially Vinnie Van Beck, as a young child as he recovers from RSV, for Colin Olson, for Larry Ziegler, for Kathy Zimmerman as she recovers from her surgery, for Gary Boysen, for John Tuft, for Abby Johnson, for Lila Brunn, for Nancy Schmidt, for Jennifer Quast, for Jeffrey Erickson, for Jack Thien, for Sue Murphy, for Stephanie Holcomb, for Howard Breitkreitz, for Nikki Dahl, for Cheryl Corson, for Neil Holton, for Mark Peterson, Pete Emery, Evie Schreiber, Laura Schinnebarger, Carol Chorley, Patty Stennis, Don Wilkie, Leon Wonderlich, Judy Shorter, Addie Mork, Evelyn Bulky, Michelle Wren, Paul and Naomi During, Ron Rogers, and Mike Newind. Keep them from every evil that can befall the body, mind, or soul. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, the time is fulfilled and your kingdom is at hand as your beloved Son comes to us here today. Grant that by your Spirit we would receive him in repentance and believe the gospel that is proclaimed to us here today. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we see how the adversary continually afflicts us and walks about as a roaring lion seeking to devour us. We implore you for the sake of the suffering and death of your Son, Jesus Christ, to help us by the grace of your Holy Spirit and to strengthen our hearts by your word so that our enemy would not prevail over us, but instead that we may abide evermore in your grace and be preserved to life everlasting. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, we collect our tithes and our offerings as we sing together. Please stand as you are able as we give thanks to the Lord for these offerings in prayer.
Lord Jesus Christ, the giver of all good gifts. Our thanksgiving overflows for the life you created in us and the new life we have in you through holy baptism. Continue to shower us with your gifts as we offer thanksgiving for our ongoing communion with you in your body and blood. As you have enlarged your family today, grant that these offerings here would cause the ministry at Good Shepherd to continue bearing fruit for your eternal family. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. You may be seated as we sing our closing hymn, O Church Arise. From now the weak can say that they are strong in the strength that God has given. With shields of faith and belt of truth, we'll stand against the devil's lies. An army bold whose battle cry is love, reaching out. God's peace be to you this day as you know that he goes with you through all temptations, through all wildernesses in life because he has baptized you into his own name, which is powerful, which is victorious over all things. So a few announcements today before we head off to where God takes us. Um, this morning we've got a group Sunday school. Uh, confirmands, you don't have confirmation, but if you want to stick around and be helpers and servers of that, that would be fantastic. We would really welcome you to do that. Um, maybe you could also talk me into writing off a sermon note if you do that. <clears throat> so um, 
Uh, also, later this afternoon at 1.30, we've got a family fun day here at church. Bring snacks, bring your favorite board game, come have some fun here at church for a while. So that will be at, starting at 1.30. Uh, there's also Bible class today in the fellowship hall. We will have that. Um, we'll be talking about Revelation. Um, uh, we'll have another pastor here too if you want to pepper him with some questions. <clears throat> Um, so um, we'll be talking about Revelation 4. Also on Wednesday coming up, we've got our Lenten soup supper, which you can sign up to bring soups or desserts or other things. That's at 6 p.m. on Wednesday. And then also worship following that at 7 p.m. A uh, couple other things. Next Sunday, for, uh, starting at 12, the dartball tournament is at Villard. Uh, so if you want to come see our dartball team uh, win the tournament, right? Yeah, that would be great. Uh, you can come support us. Um, also, Saturday, February 24th, from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. over at Zion, there is a mom-to-mom -mom, uh, sale and diaper drive. So uh, just pay attention to that if you're interested. Also, further out coming up at Lutheran Island Camp, there's a men's weekend on March 8th to 10th. If you're interested in signing up for that, there should be information in your bulletin or you can talk to me or Deb. Also, there's a women's weekend April 26th to April 28th um, coming up at Lutheran Island Camp as well. Last but not least, there's an informational meeting for any uh, youth going into ninth grade or young adults that would like to be a part of the National Youth Gathering coming up. That informational meeting will be on February 25th at 2 p.m. Are there any other announcements this morning that we're forgetting or that I'm forgetting? Okay. Uh, with that, go in peace, serve the Lord, and have a great day.